I mean, do you think Shaking we caught anything? I mean, there's just one answer to that. Do you think we caught anything? <laughs> Absolutely no chance. Oh, I've got a bite, I've got a bite. Fifteen lads going to Amsterdam. What could possibly go wrong? You are right there, Dave, lad. Splendid. That's it, what a catch, what a catch! Each one of them lads, it's him, he's in them seats, isn't he? There he is. He's in the best seats in the house. That's what Peter does for you. I swear to you that that particular day, we didn't need a doctor, we needed a welder. There's a fish. No wonder I somersaulted into the floor. Just landed straight on my head. He's called Paul, and he's got one thumb, one tooth, and two hearing aids. He's got toothache in this one tooth. What are they doing in that slip cordon? I said, well, that's great. I said, because you'll be able to get some new ones. He says, no, I'm not getting any new ones. He said, I'm borrowing my mother's. <laughs> He says she leaves them at the side of the bed. Hello, boys. Have you any idea what's going on here? No, it's not a sausage. Hey. I am Johnny Cash. Apologies if you're just joining TalkSport 2 and have been confused by the last minute and a half. But, of course, that was uh, David Bumble Lloyd. I was lucky enough to interview you recently for a book that I'm writing, Bumble, and um, we had a young uh, kid who was listening in to the call. And he, and he said, you would ask him a question and Bumble would give you three different anecdotes. And very rarely were any of the anecdotes exactly what you asked for, but he said they were all brilliant. <laughs> and and it, 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 it made me think about your entire career. And I, I want to come to it eventually about who you have become, right, rather than who you started as. But to begin with, as a cricketer, did you get everything out of your cricket career that you thought you should have? Uh, no, you, you, you always got regrets about your own career. And people say you've done this, this, this. What, what's best? Well, there's nothing better than playing. And at times you, you think, you, you reflect and look back and think, well, you know, I should have done a bit better than I did. I started on uncovered pitches, which were pretty tough. I started as a left arm spinner and wasn't very good. Finished up as a batter. Um, would bat five, four, open for quite a long time. Uh, but... You know, you have a lot of fun and a lot of heartache about it as well when you're a player. Uh, but you do quietly in that quiet moment reflect, well, you know, I wish I'd have worked a bit harder and got a bit better. Geoffrey Boycott was kingpin at the time, John Edrich, as I was an opener. And I would only get into any test team if they were not available or injured. And then I had to be absolutely on top of my game as well. And if I wasn't, they'd pick somebody else. Um is, is one reason that that you stayed around in cricket afterwards, uh, well, I mean, other than the fact that you didn't go to school much, you told me the other day because you were so busy practicing for cricket all the time. So you didn't have a, another trade, but was the other reason was that you felt like you still had something to give the game afterwards? Well, it, it, you know, I, I love cricket. I love the game. It can give me, you know, a wonderful life. And so I think I was lucky and, and making good decisions. So whilst I was playing, take my coaching badges I was interested so we'll take the badges and we did it all in the UK at Lillishill at the National Sports Centre as it was at then so when I finished playing I'd got qualifications behind me to carry on in the game in some capacity I tried industry and business and that just it, within six months this, this is not me and so I applied to get onto the umpires list and I had two years as a reserve so what does that mean, being a reserve umpire? I could do... It sounds like unemployed. Se no, you do second 11. Oh, OK. And uh, university, which is lots of university cricket at the time. And so I would learn umpiring with, with established umpires, Barry Mayer, Dickie Bird, all the others that were around at that time. And so I would be making decisions, but they wouldn't be decisions in county championship. And the other thing at that time, I was not allowed to umpire or you weren't allowed to umpire the county that you came from so I couldn't umpire Lancashire matches and so eventually I got onto the full list um, and I did three and a half years thoroughly enjoyed it but but you, the umpire was king you know they the players looked up to you and didn't challenge you and then DRS came in so you could challenge I was out of that 
how good an umpire do you think you got to? Like, if you just said that you didn't get everything out of yourself as a player. What about as an umpire? Uh, like every other umpire, you make mistakes. And the trick is, don't make too many. And so you were marked by the captain. The, the captain would give you a mark. And, he, you know, you, you'd, I did all right. I did fine. And, and I believe that I was shortlisted to do one-day internationals. Uh, but I, I, I was brought out by the then Teston County Cricket Board to head up quick cricket, which was an offshoot of, I think, in Australia, Kanga cricket. Yeah. And so w it was all into primary schools with plastic cricket bats, try to get young children involved in the game of cricket. Um, because at, at that stage in primary schools, I don't know whether it's any different, they would be playing rounders. So if you're playing rounders, why not have a go at playing cricket with cricket equipment, which wouldn't hurt them. You know, cricket's a hard ball, so we had a, a, a slight, well, a much softer ball, which was was good for the children. So I was brought out of umpiring to head that up um, and moved on through coaching at the same time. Mickey Stewart was England coach at the time, and and I was helping him out from, from time to time in, in various guises. You go from that to leading the team. It, it feels like the umpiring thing happens and you make a conscious decision you spend two years getting good at it then you you end up at the professional level um you know doing it at the top level toward as you said towards the international level coaching you start helping out and then when do you start to take that seriously as a career well i was asked to take the under 19s on a couple of tours so it's kicked in then you know you, you're always i mean there's not that many coaches so you you know, you're always looking for a bit of employment. I, I never chased it. Um, I was doing other things and speaking at dinners, you know, going around the country speaking at dinners, which, which eventually, I have to say and be honest, it did me in. It did my head in. I'd, I'd had enough. And I still get people now asking me, can you speak at this dinner? And I just have to politely say, I just cannot do it. I, I, I've served my time. Other people would be doing that. So doing the under-19s, put me in the frame I then went back to Lancashire and I think that's so important I spent a long time away from Lancashire a long long time a decade and a, a lot more than that and then you go back and you don't know anybody and and so you you're new to the job and and you've got your own ideas and so it, it moved on from there I was Lancashire coach and then uh, you know moved into England did you enjoy the England coaching job? Loved it, absolutely loved it. We were skint as a, as a board. You know, we had no money. There were no central contracts. Players would, you know, you'd turn up on a Tuesday night, have a damn good meal, a um, bit of practice on a Wednesday, and play on the Thursday, and then go back to your counties. And, and what struck me was that it, it was in the days of CFAX. Mm. And so there'd be a television in the room, and the lads were representing England, and the CFAX was on and just looking at the county scores. You know, we're, we're just there and playing for England was like an icing on the cake. I'm a county cricketer and I play for England. And it was, we were pushing in the late 90s for central contracts, you know, to, to manage the players and to be England players. And David Graveney was, was chairman of the selectors. Raymond Nillingworth uh, was very much involved at that time. But the board had no money. And then the big broadcast deals came in, changed the whole complexion of the funds were then available for all sorts of things. Academies, Lions Tours, umpires, coaching, all through the big broadcast deals. You, you talked about, you know, speaking at all those dinners and, and for players of your era, that was kind of a way to make a living and, and you know, going to... Uh, clubs and and uh, places and and speaking. When does the media stuff start, though? Um, again, you, you you've got to be lucky in life. And as I'd finished playing in the sort of early eighties, Lancashire was was still doing fine in one day competitions, and they got into it. Might have been a Benson and Edges final. It was it was against Sussex. At, it's at Lords, and I got a call from Peter Baxter who was producer on Test Match Special. And I would be the Lancashire voice at this Lord's celebratory final versus Sussex. John Barclay, who's become a dear friend, who was captain of Sussex at the time, was the Sussex guy. And he's posh, Johnny, J.R.T. Barclay, John Richard Troutbeck Barclay. 
He's posh and he's a cravat. He, no, he didn't have a cravat. Okay, he wouldn't have it. He, he quite the other way. He'd have a, a, a nice trilby on. Um, and so you've John from Sussex and this Lancashire lad. And it, it turned out just by being lucky and doing that, the, the voice was attractive to radio, is what Peter Baxter told me. And I moved on doing various one day games for the BBC at that time and then got invited on to Test Match Special. Now, I still pinch myself that I worked on that programme for a long time. You would have grown up listening to it? I've grown up listening to it. I'm working with Brian Johnson, Henry Blofeld, Christopher Martin Jenkins, Bill Frindle, Trevor Bailey, Fred Truman, who's one of my all-time heroes, Fred Truman, Jonathan Agnew as a young lad. We had an absolute ball. It, it was fabulous. It, you know, that was a wonderful time to, to be in a commentary box. And I thought, <laughs> you, you, you'll love this. When I first got invited, I thought it was a script. I thought you had to read the script. And you go, give me the microphone, off you go. I thought, oh, what have I got to say? And obviously, you just describe what you see. When do you make the move into then TV? Uh, when um, satellite television came in, I believe in 1991, and there were there was Sky t Television and BSB. It was called British Satellite Broadcasting, and that got swallowed up by Sky. I was with BSB, and when it got swallowed up, I moved into Sky. I moved across to Sky, and then I had the break and moved into England Coaching, and then as I left in 1999, I got a call from the head of cricket at Sky, as I'm leaving, he's been said he's leaving, and there's gonna be a media that he's leaving. And John Gaylord, who was the head of an uh, Australian guy, uh, red-headed, bearded, raw-boned Australian fella, he rang, you're leaving, join us. And, and so I'm a bit down at the time, and I think, well, oh, you know, I need a bit of time. He said, you've got 10 minutes to tell me. He said, ring me back. He said, because we're going to jump on the back of this media the, from the ECB, the Test and County Cricket Board, as it probably was, was it? He, no, it might have been ECB. He said, we're going to jump on the back of that and announce that you're working for us, and that's exactly what happened. So he's leaving, there's cameras rolling, press conference, media questions, finish that, and he's joining us. So then they gave me, a, you know, the microphone with the Sky logo on it and that. And so I've now moved straight into Sky. I'm still a bit down. I wanted to carry on with England. It wasn't going to be. And I said to John, you know, I'd like a bit of time off. He's Australian, red-headed, bearded, raw-boned. You start next week, you're in next week. And so it was whirlwind. And I had a fabulous time at Sky. I had an absolutely fabulous time. But it gave me an opportunity. And you, you like to, to go and work on Channel 9. I mean, that's the holy grail to be involved in Channel 9. Fantastic. To do TMS and Channel 9, that's kind of the two most important, you know, broadcast uh, pillars that cricket was built on, right? Yeah, and to, to work in that Channel 9 box with Tony Gregg, Richie Benno, Bill Laurie, Ian Chappell, it was, oh, bang on. Absolutely bang on. Not knowing the business, know the business, and outrageous at times. Great fun. I mean, that's important. Great fun. When do you sort of become the face of T20 cricket, early T20 cricket, and, and become the, the start the car? I think I've got a T-shirt at home. It actually just says um, start, start the, the car, car on it. I can't and believe it, that. And, and, I was embarrassed with that. that, <laughs> but, that they produce some T-shirts, some, some, some fans, some supporters. Yeah, it's just a fan group. Someone gave it to me. Yeah, I, I've got I've, I've got to tell you, I've I, I got to bed in it now. It's my T-shirt, but i got to bed in it. I start the car on my face on the front of it. 2003 that first started. I got it straight away. And, you know, being in England, you know, I go back to Gillette Cup. Oh, this will never catch on. You know, 60 overs, 65 overs, 60 overs. Oh, and then they're bringing 40 over cricket in. This will never catch on. Sunday League cricket. You know, they went from strength to strength. And T20 was off, I, I, my, in my opinion, it was off and running immediately. You know, it, it captured the imagination of the public. I still think it's the premier uh, one-day competition. 
because it fills. You look at this blast. I think the blast is a wonderful, fabulous competition. I've worked at the IPL, and that is sheer entertainment with some great players, and it works unbelievably in India. Fill the ground, 80, 90,000 people. And so it, it was an instant success, was that. Did you... I, I, mean, I talked to Danny Morrison once, and you, you would know Danny Morrison a little bit as well. Danny Morrison, when you meet him in real life, he's absolutely nothing like the Danny Morrison that you see on TV. He, he sees it as a, as a role, as, as a, you know, like he, his mum was in the theatre and his theatre is commentating on TV in, in cricket. And we, we, you are much more naturally like that. And I wondered if all those years of being an umpire and a player and having to be serious and going on TMS and everything else. Finally, when T20, T20 comes along, it's almost like cricket becomes a little bit more bumble and you're like, well, I can expand who I am and, and have a freedom to perform the way I like to um, a little bit more. I also think you need good producers and good people around you. And, and from that sky environment at that time, I'll say at that time, I'll stress that, take it to the edge. Just be yourself, take it to the edge. Be outrageous, we will back you. Uh, and it, it just gives you free license. But if T20 wasn't around, you might not have had that freedom? No, I'd, I'd have enough sense to, to back off. And I'd yeah. still, you know, I, I, we're working here at TalkSport and I love it to bits, to, to sort of go full circle from starting in the radio, branching out into TV, to come back to radio. Radio is the nuts and bolts of cricket. It, it is very much so, uh, because you're talking all the time. You have to talk all the time. In TV, you've got to let it wash. Just shut up. Just let it go. And we were told constantly uh, by one of the producers who became head of Sky, Barney Francis, less is more. And he'd tell us time and time again, less is more. And working with Warney, who, 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 Warney was absolute mortar mouth. He'd go, boop, 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 and, and he would understand it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, less is more, less is more. Somebody tell me to shut up. And, and so, you know, the enthusiasm comes through. But I like the element of, if, you, if you're broadcasting on a cricket match for seven hours, you've got to lighten it up a bit. You can't be you can't be dead serious for seven hours. You have a bit of fun. There's difference between lightening up a little bit. So when you started on TMS, you probably weren't expecting to end up singing Elvis songs um, on TV, right? Like there's a big difference between you being Bumble and 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 you're on there because you've got the great voice and you know a lot about cricket and you're fun. That's not quite in, a, in singing in front of a crowd at uh, at finals day, is it? Like no, it it moves on and there's there's always that frustrated karaoke. And Andrew Flintoff was another. And we, we were seriously vying against each other. He's doing Elvis, and, and I'm doing Neil Diamond, Sorry, Sweet you Caroline. Did do, you're right. I should have remembered it was Freddie in the Elvis suit, wasn't it? <laughs> and he, I mean, he's dead serious. He, he said, I'm doing it, I want a proper suit. I want to be el dressed up as Elvis. And then he trips up over the speaker. He forgets the words, and he wins the competition. I, I was most upset, because I kicked off with Johnny Cash. I like a bit of Johnny Cash, Folsom Prison. And then went into Sweet Caroline. And, do you know, you'd think that in sta standing there at, in front of 25,000, you need a stiff drink before you do that because you're not very good. <laughs> but you, the enthusiasm is there. You've got to have a go. But I'll come back to TMS. If it was around at that time, I'll guarantee that Brian Johnson would have had a go. <laughs> he would have had a sing. I, I want to I talk about... Uh, you would have grown up in an area where some of your friends, uh, you know, would have had pretty much one career all the way through their life, right? Um, you know, I, I look at my father, who's, you know, a similar age to you. He basically did the same job just for different companies over, uh, overall. And, you know, lots of people of that era did that. It's a bit different now. People do all different jobs. But look at your life. You know, you're a professional cricketer. You're an umpire. You're a coach your radio, your TV, your, you're doing public speaking, you're doing all these different things. It's, be, it's, almost, it's almost like you are just going from whatever interests you at the time and, just, and latching onto it rather than looking for a career. Well, I came from a very modest background. Um, my mother was one of 13. My dad was one of five. Can you name all your aunties and uncles? No, I did. did a lot of them had died before I appeared. I was even... Uh, yeah. yeah, so... We, I had a tough upbringing. I've never forgotten where I come from. 
I come from a town called Accrington, a terraced house and an outside toilet. And we were talking earlier about no double glazing and no central eating, nothing like that. It was tough. There was a song around by the animals, Eric Burden, we got to get out of this place. And that dr it really drove me on. So I, football is my sport, I love football to bits. But cricket was the business and it was going to get me out and get me better, give me a better life. And so, you know, that's what took over. But the background, I have never lost that Accrington background. And I might be an amiable sort of bloke. Don't cross me. Don't mess with me. That, I, because that is from when I was four. Don't mess with me. But, so... You know, the, the opportunities that cricket gave you then really is, that's how you moved your life on, right? Yeah, and to join Lancashire County Cricket Club was, was the dream. And all the talk now about county cricket as to it's pushed into winter and it's pushed into autumn. Every cricketer that I know has started in the UK in county cricket. That's where you start. It is vital, absolutely vital, to develop your game. That's where you develop your game. And it's a, a, a process where you, you join as a, a youngster into a team of experienced senior professionals and they show you the ropes. They guide you through. And I can't see it any different now because when we commentate, we talk about the leaders. They talk, the big word, buzzword is leadership. The leadership group. Senior pros. That's what that is, your senior pro, guiding the young player through. And, and you know, I'll just mention one who, who became a great player, Michael Clark, comes into the Australia team as a little shaver, shove him in at six, right, in a great side. Pup. Pup, six, and works his way through to become a fantastic player, learning the ropes from senior players. And that's how it's been all the way through. And so you marvel at the game that we're watching now, that India producing so many young players who step right into the team. You, you've got to learn your trade. And they, we talk about the Ranji Trophy. That's where they're learning the trade, definite. But, but you talk about learning the trade. So you had to learn cricket, then umpiring, then coaching, now broadcasting. How much of that is natural and how much have you had to work on all those things? Well, you, m my dad um, had a job, but he was also a lay preacher. And he was very, whereas my mother was volatile, really, really volatile. I get a clip round the ear regular. My dad was very quiet and demure. And if he spoke, he's one of them, and if he, you just listen, he didn't say much. Um, be yourself, just be, and that stood by me, just, just be yourself. I'm, I'm quite a private bloke. I come alive, give me a microphone and a cricket match, I, I just, move I, I just get into a, a sort of overdrive you, you don't see me out too much i had, had my mates when i was at sky i would knock about with ian ward michael atherton nasser hussein a couple of the producer young lads that would be us we were pretty regular no no clubbing whatever young people do these days no just pretty regular my own group of friends um, look, right now, we have nothing to do with cricket, tractor drivers, farmers, um, engineers, retired engineers. I've got a very interesting pal who's a crime scene investigator, um, and he's got he's got me into allotments, and he's got his own allotment, and he's got me into it. And I said, "How did you get into this, Howard?" He, he said, "Because of what I've seen in the job, this gets me right away from it." And so I'm, I'm a pretty private bloke but give me a cricket match and a microphone and I think I'm a bit different final question playing cricket umpiring coaching talking about it all the things that you've done I'm not going to ask you which one you think you're best at but I'm more interested in which one you are most proud of right we all want it all of us who get the opportunity to work in cricket we want to leave the sport in a better place than when we started it which is the one that you think you've achieved that the most um commentating um, as, that's, that's the word that you use, achievement. What have you achieved most? And, you know, I'm sort of humbled that I've won so many awards. I've got independ independent awards, um, which, which is nice. I've, I've got a BAFTA. There's not many have got one of them. Um, 
and the, the cricket writers presented me with the uh, Peter Smith Award. Now, that, that was special. Yeah, I mean, to, to please that lot, if you could please them cricket writers... I don't know writers, why you're looking at me when you say that. Lot, yeah, the, I, I mean, they are... I, I've been with them and around them for, for all my career. I think they are the salt of the earth. I mean, the enthusiasm that all the cricket writers bring in, except one, um, I think they're absolutely fantastic. 